And, but I wasn't needed because they were someone's check. So I walk upstairs to the, went to the show. On this entire first floor was not one customer. Everybody in the booth were the salesmen hanging out. And about a third of the salesmen were down trying to get my wife to sell them a computer. <laughs> that was the last time, right? The last time, 1977 was the last time the computer industry lived. They didn't know it for about another five years, right? Ultimately, IBM had to go in, everybody else had to go in. But that was the last day. And it was because what we had done was to build a computer that did what people wanted it to do. Now, was it the ultimate computer? No, we went on and we put floppy disk on everything else. I just wrote a note about WAS. Um, you know, when we all started, we were kind of competing, but you know, ultimately we weren't competing. Gates would go to the show, Marco would go to the show, I'd go to the show, John Roach would go to the show, whoever it was, a financial presentation, anything else. And we would have to tell people why they wanted a computer. And people would say, hey, well, you know, why do I want a computer? I don't need to keep track of my checkbook or anything. And we said, you have to own one to know why you want to buy it. But it turns out I never had to tell one person who had ever programmed in basic why they wanted a computer. Once they saw the computer, they bought it. Right? Six months after we were in the market, Radio Shack and Apple had to go to Gates and get licenses for basic. Now, Apple went, they paid about three times what we paid. Roach went and he told Gates, he said, look, I don't want to pay you what you want because he doubled the price again. So it was for the Z80 and Gates liked the Z80, so we wanted a lot more money for it. And Roach said, I don't want to pay that money. Why don't you take a fee for every computer I set up? Gates says, I don't need $25 a month. Okay? <laughs> what I want to spend my money. That money that he got from Roach and those guys gave him enough leverage that when we introduced the computer in Japan, there was a guy by the name of Kei Nishi who started a magazine. I was 19 years old. Started a magazine called ASCII, which some of you may have heard of. Kay came to the United States, met Gates at a show, fell, the two of them fell in love with one another. He went up to Microsoft, put Gates into Japan to do what was called the, uh, it was called the X computer, okay? And all these guys paid Gates up front for basic. So all of a sudden, Gates had a standard product called basic. You had to have it. And he, Bill Gates, now had a bunch of money from these guys in Japan. Those guys in Japan had the misfortune to come out with their beautiful new computer right against the C64. And of course, they got killed, right? So you never heard about it, right? Most people in the United States didn't hear about it. Because by that time, the Big 20 had been out a little while, and the C64 came along and just killed them. But Gates got all his money for BASIC, and he had BASIC established as a standard. Now, I'm going to take you down one little path, and then we'll go back and finish Commodore. Gates, at this point, has some money. He decides that he lost his license in Nevada, I mean, in, in New Mexico, decides he's going to move to and he wants to go into the applications business. So he makes a deal to steal a guy for word from, from Xerox. He makes a deal with a couple of these guys. And he's sitting up there working on applications. If you were to ask him during that period of time what his future was, it was going to be languages and applications. He was in the operating system business. While he was sitting in Seattle, some guys came to him and said, we've knocked off, um, oh, it can't be that old. CPM. CPM? Digital Research. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, too much. I'm trying to keep too many threads in my head. Okay. Um, we go out and knock off CPM. Okay, good, right? Um, I'm going to just tell this one story because I think it's been told badly and I know the truth. Okay? Yeah. IBM started the PC because of VisiCalc and Apple, right? Because of VisiCalc and Apple, IBM was willing to go into the computer business because a lot of their customers were buying Apple IIs and take them into the office and they wanted to stop that, right? But most of you don't realize that at that time, it was a, IBM was very successful with a word processing system that they were not, they were going head to head with Xerox. 
So there were two things that, that control what the original PC was. It couldn't compete with Direct. So therefore, they had to put a lot of limitations in, which ultimately Joe Perkuti took out in the second version of the PC. And secondly, they had to target it clearly at the same market as the Apple, unless it is a cup. So they went on this buying trip. They went to Southern California, and they had to buy floppy disks from somebody. And Jack and Jackie Tan had just gone into business, so they signed Jackie up because they couldn't buy from Xerox, who was shoe guard. And then they went up to Monterey to buy CPM. Well, they had gotten a contract that they'd given the guy at CPM. Uh, and there were a couple of phrases that the CPM contract had in it that IBM, under their consent decree, could not sign. So they kept telling the people that were talking about CPM, we can't sign your contract. Please accept these changes. We're not going to rip you off, none of that kind of problem, but please, we're in a consent decree. They didn't actually say we're in a consent decree, but it was obvious what was going on. And the, the following fact is true. There's a big story about Kildall was out flying an airplane. He wasn't. Mrs. Kildall and the guy that worked for me were sitting in a room with these guys from IBM, and they kept saying, we need to have you sign this. And the guys would say, we can't. Please go talk to your lawyer again. We go outside and talk to the lawyer. And the lawyer was with, with the head of, of um, CPM. And the lawyer kept saying, don't worry about these guys. You, you sold a contract to TI, they didn't do anything. You sold a contract deck, they didn't do anything. Don't let IBM change it. The guys were making money off of them, or the guys doing the SOL and all this other thing. And if you, do, if you make this change, I'll have to go back and redo their contract. So the guys from IBM got an airplane with no resolution. And Kill on meet with them because he didn't you know, he didn't want to tell them no. He was trying to still cut a deal. They flew up to, to uh, meet Gates. They signed a deal for the basic. Gates told him he was going to do some stuff with Word, things like that. They were all interested in that. And they said to him the following set of words. Cause, and again, I know this to her. I wasn't there, but I, I talked to people who were there. Would you please call Kildall and tell him you just signed our contract. He should sign it too. And Gates made a momentous decision. He says, I don't have to call Kildall. I'll give you the, the, the system. He went out and bought the MS-DOS, the futures, what you saw. Right? I don't know if you know the ultimate story of Gary. He finally committed suicide. Um, terrible story. Terrible bad for him. Never listened to a lawyer. Okay, but that basic that we signed up for on the way driving across country is the reason why Microsoft is where they are today. And if you ask Gates, he'll admit it. All right? So Commodore literally drove that market in the following on markets. I'm going to finish the story. Um, I told you about Fagans. I told you about Fuji. So I think I've got almost everybody that matters up to a certain point. At this point, remember Dr. Kim. But what happened is Dr. Kim I went back to the well and said, well, I've got to go develop a disk drive system. I need some more people. And he gave me um, Scott Patterson and Glenn Stark. Glenn Stark's one of the world's best engineers, truly one of the world's best engineers. We we're very lucky to get him. Uh, uh, he, he just was just great. Um, and Scotty is a great programmer, but, but, but uh, Glenn is just spectacular. The two of them came out right out of school and designed a floppy disk. And the first one they did didn't do random read and write. So we had to kind of change that a little bit. And we finally did one. The problem was, is while we were screwing around, Waz came out with his disk drive, which was not in any way as elegant as what we're doing. It didn't work as well as anything else. But he beat us to market by three months. And Jack Kimmel never forgave me that we did that. So it was kind of the beginning of my end with Commodore. Um, we did do a dual disk drive system. Uh, one of the things we did at Commodore that was very important, and again, I'm not sure if had uh, has this in their mind, obviously, you can't have a computer that does what you want it to do and not be able to list, OK? Well, the only printer we had was a teletype, right? Or you could buy a Centronics printer for about $2,000. OK, so I got this $250.
Okay, so I got this $350 computer, and I hang a $2,000 computer on it. So I went to the guy at his electronics, and I said, look, um, I need a computer that I can sell for in the same price range as this. And if you'll do that, I'll guarantee you a few million product. Because at this point in time, we knew the, the patent was going to take off, and we could see the, where we're going with some of the other things. Um, the guy basically said, the guy at Citronics said, and I remember sitting in his hotel room in New York saying this, he said, I don't need to do that. You guys will come and match me. And in that room, I told him, I said, listen, it's real simple. I'm going to Japan. I'm going to get a product that meets my price point, and they're going to kill you. Now, this is the last time you get to have this conversation. Am I going to do that or are you going to do it? He said, go. You can't beat me. So um, we went to the guys at Seiko. Right? They built the first computer. They built the, the took one of their calculator printers, extended it. I sat down and designed the, the hardware interface for it. And ultimately, the Epson became one of the world's larger suppliers of uh, printers because of that stupid conversation. Um, you know, once Epson was successful, other people copied them, and that's why Canon went into business and other people, but it was ultimately uh, Seiko and, and, and Epson that did it. So Commodore, first printer designed for personal computers, um, and effectively forced the industry that became the printer industry that you know it is today. So we pioneered in built-in screens, right? Mac came back and did that. We did it, Victor. I mean, it's been back and forth. We pioneered in the use of floppies, real floppies. We had developed in our research lab uh, a hard drive. You know, hard drives weren't ready. Uh, we had done the, the um, camera. We had done a whole series of things. We were working on a product at Tremel's direction that says Kill Apple. Uh, I had taken a small hiatus and gone to Apple for about six months, left Commodore, went to Apple, during which time Steve and I were talking about what became to Lisa, and he went to Park and decided that he was going to take the logic from Park and create which is effectively Windows and the Apple operating system today. Um, and he was right. He was wrong about what the Lisa was. The Lisa was too expensive. Um, luckily, a guy by the name of Jeff Raskin invented the, the, the uh, Mac and saved Apple again. Uh, but that period was very useful for me because I was there and, and we knew kind of, I kind of knew where Apple was going. So um, Tremel wanted to, to beat them. Uh, and so I'm going to take it at the end of the story. Um, we've now built several extended versions of the uh, Commodore product, most of which were sold mostly in Europe, right? And you've seen them there, the fancier printers, the machines with more memory, the, these products. And we were getting a reasonably decent business market for those products in Europe. Um, but Tremel wanted to knock off Apple and he wanted to be in the consumer electronics business. So this is the final story. Remember I said Bill Seiler? Bill Seiler was in love with games, right? Just absolutely in love with them. So, and he got really good at video. So one day in the lab, which we were fooling around with, he took one machine and he built this 20 screen Screw, uh, product on the screen and we started playing with it and we could run the basic and we moved two or three games to it. And he said, you know, MOS technology is working on what ultimately became the C64 interface, but it's delayed. It's going to be another year. Why don't we go show this to Tremel? So we took it to a, we were actually doing a demo in, uh, at the uh, January Consumer Electronics Show. We set up this little technology suite and Sala brought his little machine in and showed it to Tremel. And Tremel was pissed because he said, you guys are supposed to build the Apple knockoff machine. This is not the Apple knockoff machine. Don't bother me. <laughs> I'm going to finish the story right now. Without the work that the guys at MOS Technology did to follow on with the work that Sala had started but was told stop, there never would have been a Vic 20. There never would have been a Commodore 64. Because shortly thereafter, Tremel disbanded our laboratory and all of us left and went off to do the first MS-DOS machine. Um, but 
because the guys at MOS Technology picked up the ball and ran with it, saying, this is a product that needs to happen. They got Jack to listen. Uh, Siler actually did a lot of work. Stark did the interface. Fagans did the software. It doesn't matter who did that. But the, the drive came from the guys in the lab. And then we bailed out because Jamal basically told us to quit doing what we're doing. And we knew that we wanted to build a business computer, so we went off and did the first ms dos machine. And at this point, the Commodore story moves to the web, moved to the East Coast. And I'm done because I've told you the people that got us there, and I've told you the story of how we got there. And we got there because we knew the market. We got there because we paid attention to the market. We were doing machines for the market. And we did a whole bunch of innovations because we had a small set of smart guys. I will tell you that that small set of smart guys went a good part of it with me. We did the first clone machine, it was only it was a super clone, and we won our computer of the year award for that one. And then about five years later, we won a computer of the year award for our impact. That team stayed with me forever. We did a lot of very wonderful things together. Commodore literally forced out most of the team. Luckily, Fagan stayed. For, for Commodore, luckily, Fagan stayed. Uh, Shiraz picked it up, and the, really the West Coast, the East Coast guys picked it up and drove it. Uh, I know Russell had some things to do with it, and he's going to tell you about that. And I, I'm sorry, I, I, my story ends. Um, we had. I, I told Jack to milk, who sued me, took away all my money, I made a comment or everything else. I told him about four years ago, when I met him for the first time in 10 years, that he gave me a chance to do something nobody else would do. The Commodore machine was what I wanted to do. We did it. We did it as a small team. It worked. The things we did later on worked. Uh, but without Tramel, without Paven, and without all these other people I told you about, none of this would have ever happened. And I've tried to, in this little story, tell you about how we got there and why we got there. And uh, one last little piece. Siler got to be really good with computers. Okay? By the time we were ready to go, and he's sitting there playing with it and everything else. And we're getting ready to go to a show, and I said, look, Bill, in a year from now, there's a whole bunch of kids that are going to take this machine you've been playing with, and they're going to kick your ass. Because they are going to grow up without any inhibitions. They're going to know how to do any, remember this Project Mac? They're going to grow up with the ability to create anything. You're too inhibited. He didn't believe me. He thought I would laugh at me. A year and a half later, he comes to me and says, you're right, they're kicking my butt. And he was good, right? What's happened is, and probably three quarters of the people in the room I'm talking to, are the people that came along next. And you've created a world. I happen to live in it, a bunch of other people in it. We had the fun to start it. We had the fun to see it grow. But the people that made it happen were the people that came along next that could feel about computing in a totally different way because of what we did. End of my story. Seriously, uh, we lost track. Of, we lost track of you, uh, you know, uh, in the last few years. So hopefully, you're going to tell me what you're doing sometime, right? Well, uh, I've tried to reestablish some of these contact with some of these guys. Well, I'll send you an email yeah. where Will's at because I run into him at auto shows, still in regular faces out here. So yeah, well, I, but I'm also interested in what you're doing. I think you and I got caught up one time, not that long ago. But you got to see my factory, my 4,500 computers. You got to tell me what you're doing. Okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for this personal interlude, but he was. By the way, where, where did I hire you from? Uh, you got me directly. Uh, Roger got me into your organization. So that's where I was going to make the point. 
good old Roger Cam fed me the best people in the world for a long time before I finally screwed up and moved him to California, right? Um, it, was, uh, it was like, you know, I think every year he'd find somebody that could stand weirdness and send them our way. And, uh, you know, those people, uh, every one of the team he sent me was spectacular, right? I mean, uh, they were all a little idiosyncratic in places, right? You, you less than some of the others, but, uh, um, but on the other hand, they, uh, you know, you know and I know that they made it happen. Okay, uh, uh, this is Evan again. Um, we have 15 or so minutes of Q&A from the intercommer guys. We'll open it up to the general audience. Uh, so. They don't have anything to ask me. We <laughs> <laughs> you know what happened. How, how well we've, all told, we've, we've all told the same lies. <laughs> hey, Chuck, this is Bill Hurt. Bill Hurt, I've read about you now. That book, what, can anybody remember the name of the book? We should make sure everybody's read it. What's the name of the book? What's the name of the book? Seen by right. here. On the edge, yeah. yeah. Make sure that make sure everybody knows about it. If they don't already. Uh, that guy did a great job of writing you up. Right. I, I, I don't know you, but I know you drink heavy. <laughs> Actually, my last drink was 17 years ago on May 29th. Is that right? Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, so I just Congratulations. So I, I have the memories of a crazy person uh, that lived in the Commodore environment. Um, we didn't get to be the pioneers that, that you were. My experience was mostly about uh, kind of the environment we inherited and how to live in, in the days of Tremel and, and live you know, right after Tremel. Um, but I do have a Chuck Paddle uh, kind of story kind of question here. Uh, one day we were talking, I was talking with Benny Pruden. I don't know if you knew him or remember him, but Benny was one of those people that would just light a room up with his laughter. And so, in a real stressful environment like that, you go seek out Benny sometime. Benny, please help me. And uh, we were talking about something on the O2, and he goes, wait a minute. And he grabs me, and we go into the Kalma area, and he grabs uh, Michael Angelina. And Michael says, yeah, we've got that somewhere here. And I go, got what? And he goes, it's over here. And I'm like, what? And he opens the bottom drawer on this, on this, uh, uh, of the drawings, and there's the, like a handwritten 6502 schematic. And this was like a religious experience for me. It's like the lights dim, there's chanting and incense burning. And, and I didn't know you guys had actually written on parchment, but that's what it looked like. It's all coiled up and everything. And we're looking at this hand-drawn schematic, and then suddenly Benny starts laughing. And he taps what would later become known as the SO pen. And it says in pencil on this, it says CP or CPS. Do you remember what that pen was? No. And they called it the Chuck Pedal Special Pin. And that, that was named yeah, right. your desire for the set overflow pin on, on that on that processor. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. just funny to see it in pencil written in there. It was kind of a homage to a desire you had to have this input into this. Benny was the only guy I ever knew that used it. He used it in a disk drive for like the fastest six microsecond loop you can make or something like that. Yeah, well, what we did there, I'll be frank with you, we started with a minute. I could have spent a lot more time on you. I wanted to go on to show you. What we did is we, we took the minimum set that we got from Carnegie Mellon and from Beck, and we put in the addressing extensions I wanted. And then when we got down at kind of the end, we kind of said, okay, what are the things we can add without blowing the chip size? Because one time we blew the chip size 10 mils, which was forbidden at that point. And Will and I had to spend like a week you know, erasing lines, doing AND gates, doing everything we could to get the chip size back down. So it was hard to get another instruction in, but so if it was something easy, we put it in uh, if we had the pins and everything else. So I, I, I think I remember that was just, it was there, it was kind of easy to do, so we did it, right? Right, right. Was the 6502 really a, a design to be a printer controller? I heard that rumor, that the X and Y uh, registers right. were for not at all. Okay. Not, not, not at all. Not at all. No, no. X and Y are, you know, obvious, right? X and Y are variable. But if you look at them, they're very powerful index registers, right? Yeah. I, I really, I, one, I grew up in a computer environment. I understood NXT, but I was, I had a, to do a, uh, a design with the PP11, and, and you know, those guys are really good at. They were guys who are really good at addressing, and so the combination. You know, I just did some things that were that were obvious to me had to be done. But you got to remember, the 6502 was never intended to be a central processor. 
ever. Right? If it wasn't for Gates having an interpreter, that thing would have died from that standpoint. It would have been used in tons of places. It's still used in tons of places. But the interpretive basic, right? I didn't bother to talk about that very much. But the fact that basic was an interpreter is why we could use the 65 budget, right? I mean, what do you do with a 64-byte stack? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Bill, Bill, Bill did a nice job on the 816. I don't know if you ever looked at the 816, but he did, he did a pretty good job of extending that. The, uh, I spoke with Bill Minch once, and unfortunately, the conversation didn't go well. Um, you know, I, I did. By the way, he, by the way, you're a whole, you're, you're 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 part of a cast of thousands. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he Bill's, a, Bill's a nice guy, but sometimes he gets. One time, he and Robert Urko were trying to kill one another in a bar. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still have separated children for me and Great Berlin trying to kill each other in the parking lot of a bar. Is that right? Yeah. 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 The, the, the conversation with Mench went one day, um, you know, I didn't really, when I got to Commodore, I was just so busy doing the thing that I didn't ask enough about who had came before me. And I, I often told people, I got there and the chairs were warm and there was still a cigar going in the ashtray, but we didn't know who had just been sitting there right before us. You know, it was like, wow, well, mm -hmm. what, what, something to do, ah, you know, we're doing Shamil study and stuff like that. Um, but Bill Menchin called me to actually try and get me to use the 816, and he wanted to sell it to the Apple and to uh, us at the same time. And uh, he caught me in a moment when I was busy, and then we, we started rubbing each other the wrong way, and, and he started explaining to me, um, that having too many registers was bad because then you'd have to just save them during the interrupt. And that kind of ended our conversation. I said, you know, like, I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> but he, um, he, he tried to sell us the, the, the long and short instruction set, which is kind of where processors went. And I walked over to Freddie Bowen and said, can we use long and short? And he said, the kernel will never know whether I'm in long mode or short mode, so no. Yeah. So that ended my conversation, unfortunately, with Bill Mintz. I should have. Uh, um, yeah, but what I realized at the time, he was trying to sell it to us and Apple and create a, 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 a Mensch dynasty, as we call it. Right. So that's, I can yeah. Hey, uh, suburb, uh, uh, suburban legend, right. Urban legend question for you. You mentioned the pet name. Um, there's an urban legend I tell about the Vic and, and the Germans telexing over saying, please don't call it the Vic. Is, do you know that story and is it true? Yeah, yeah it, it, it has some relatively bad meaning. Yeah, yeah. In in uh, in uh, Germany, I don't remember that. One. I don't remember. I remember them saying that, but I don't remember what the word was. Yeah. I remember the French yeah. and yeah. yeah, German was such a laugh. The VC twenty. Yeah, the, the story. I, the story I heard was that um, we would get to Alexis says, "By the way, I can you know bring the computer over to the ship. By the way, please don't call it the big twenty. It means fornicate." <laughs> and we promptly ignored the, the telex, and we get another one. We mean it, don't call it the big 20, and we ignored that one. And so their answer was, when we got there, they had these VC20 labels made up for us, and that became yeah. the biggest telex. Hey, um, yeah. Chuck, Chuck, we had a uh, native German speaker here who was shaking his head saying that's not true. Really? <laughs> well, it definitely doesn't have any meaning. It, if you really want to, it sounds like the F word. Like oh, right. yeah. That's That's right. Right. It is, it is yeah. it's pronounced different with a V and so on. Right. So we also have the story running around all yeah. the time in Germany. So we all always suspect it was some crazy American <laughs> red <laughs> <laughs> tiny, tiny <laughs> of oh, by the way, Vic, That's why Vic, uh, legend, yeah. you know, uh, I, I think I'm I'm convinced Siler had a lot to do with the name Vic, although Yannis was also in the middle of that whole thing. But it basically meant video interface circuit, right? And um, and uh, you know the, the the 20 was the screen size, right? So I, but and I think probably Siler started calling it that first, but I'm not convinced that most technology didn't it. There was such an interaction between Bill and I, I think mostly Yannis during that period. That's hard to tell, but I, I'm going to tell you something. I know that MS Technology did a lot of the, the work to make it happen, everything else, but that was Bill Silas' dream and idea, okay? And uh, and I, he never gave me credit for it, so now he's got it. Well, I'll, I'll wrap up here, but I did want to thank you personally. Um, because of the work you did, I actually got my career. 
Uh, I started at a company that was an early adopter of the 6502, and then one day I found myself in a room with uh, Bob Russell. Uh, oh, 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 oh.